welcome to the Legendarium. This is the blue team, and uh, we are not we are not just the blue team. We are blue team made sparkly and special by our guest panelist today, Jack Butler. Jack, welcome. Thank you. We can call ourselves the blue on blue team, perhaps. Oh, blue oh. on blue. Nicely done. Well, well played, sir. Bringing in the references right off the bat. He's uh, for a well-timed glib. <laughs> and as Masad uh, al Glib uh, is what they call me. <laughs> yes. Masad al Glib. You are the Madi with, with blue, blue eyes. Kibar. Yes. <laughs> We've got Ken with us today. Of course, I'm Todd Wenty. We are, and, and as you can tell, we are going to be talking about Dune, but not Dune the movie. Uh, we're going to be talking about Chapter House Dune, the last of the Frank Herbert written books, uh, the last in this, in, in the. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to call it the official canon, but at least in the in the ones that Frank was able to write himself and kind of make his own stamp on this, before uh, life took him, before he made his his trip on the great sandworm in the sky and had to turn things over to other people that took uh, ten years for them to decipher his notes. I'm sure that that's because it was all written in probably Zen Sunni script. Um, mm -hmm. But sorry, that was my attempt at a glib. Obviously, not as good as Jack's. Um, today, with a little bit of housekeeping, you know. By the way, I I wanted to. I did put this together. I have never tried doing like Craig does with insults or any of those kinds of things. But I wrote this down. Listen to this. I said, "Welcome. We've got Jack joining us." Um, and I, Jack, I didn't put anything mean on you or or specific on you because. You are just so important and impressive. We just say Jack's joining us, and people go, "Ooh!" Uh, but I did put on. You just want to make sure I keep coming back. <laughs> uh, and then I wrote down, "Ken is punching," and I am contemplating whether or not I might be a Gola. Um, we've uh, this this book is probably a great place for the Dune process to kind of take a hiatus. I don't. know. We'll talk about that a little later, but. Um, my goodness, what a what an interesting foray into the final little bits of Dune. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. If, you've, if you're uh, just joining the conversation with us now, uh, you're welcome to join us on some of our other outlets as well. We've got uh, the website, legendarianpodcast.com. You can find us on YouTube, on Discord, if you'd like to join the conversation and uh, see what else we talk about when we're not uh, actually running an episode. Uh, any way that you can look for us, if you look for us on Legendary and Podcast. Any place in a social media network or a social or a, a browser window, you'll probably find us. Uh, and if you'd like to Where join right? Patreon and tell us that how much you enjoy everything that we do, we'd love to have you there too. So yeah. with that out of the way, um, okay, we 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 know that we have the Dune movie that just was released, and maybe we'll take like three minutes at the end to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we've been chatting about it a little bit as we've been getting ready, but I want to keep us focused all on what we're doing. Ken, do you have a recap for Chapter House Dune? Is such a right thing here. even possible? It's right here. <laughs> oh. oh, I managed to do it. <laughs> Believe me, I managed somehow to do how many, it. How many Gola incarnations did it take before you were ready for, for to do that? It... <laughs> It took the wisdom of seven billion lifetimes to come up with this one. <laughs> right in line with everything we expect. Oh Take it away, Ken. Goodness. All right. Eight years have now passed since the remnant followers of the tyrant Leto were wiped out by crazy space sex fiends. Much has changed since our favorite psychotropic desert planet was forcefully transformed from a sprawling barren desert wasteland into a sprawling barren glass wasteland. <laughs> change is good. <laughs> the Bene Gesserit find themselves the target of the honored Montres who want to assimilate the technology and superhuman skills of the Bene Gesserit, but BG's frontman Darwi O'Drade has planets of, or plans of her own, primarily involving turning their lush home planet of secret main planet, such a clever name, into <laughs> a scorched sandworm breeding ground. They've also rescued, rescued, you can see my air quotes, the remnant of the Bene Tulelalax. I never could say it. Six, <laughs> six books, I could never say it. In the form of a 5,000-year-old throwback with a vial full of DNA in his chest, but he conveniently allows them to resurrect Miles Tag and plug him back into the Matrix, so that's cool. <laughs> Ooh, nice reference. The Honored Matres also managed to blow up the Bene Gesserit's equivalent to the library at Alexandria, which would be a problem, except the last librarian manages to smuggle the info off-planet and hand it over to Space Jews! Yay! <laughs> because why not? 
<laughs> sure. I can't believe you said it that way. <sighs> I mean, what else? Is, so it's kind of funny that we're talking about this this week, not because of uh, the release of the Dune movie, but because it was just announced that History of the World Part 2 is going to be a Hulu series. And, of course, one of the things History of the World Part 1 teases in its credit sequence is, Jews in space. And that's what we've got in Chapter House Dune. We've got Jews in space. Yeah. I would have gone with space Hebrews, but, you know, either way, it works out pretty much the same. The next line going to be, it was enough to make Marjorie Taylor Green tremble in fear. <laughs> it's a little esoteric if you want, but... So... Uh... Anyway, Lucilla shares the uh, shares minds with Rebecca, who is the space Jew reverend mother. I don't know. Just go with it. Who promises to take the memories to the sisterhood, which is good since they immediately turn Lucilla over to the honor Montres, who rage kick her back to the Stone Age. <sighs> Some people. Back on Chapter House, time passes and Shiana is dragged in from the desert to <clears throat> waken Miles Tag to be the tenured... <laughs> <laughs> I... I have issues and questions. Oh, and we know you do. <laughs> they waken him up to uh, be the 10 year old Bashar to lead the Bene Gesserit military forces of the, of the sisterhood for the assault of the honored Matres. They attack the Matres. Darwe Odre dies, leaving Morbella in Morbella, Idaho, excuse me, in charge and uh, left to fuse the remnants of Bene Gesserit and honored Matres, making her the great mother superior Reverend Matre or something. I don't know. In the end, <laughs> Bottom line, sandworms are back. Marbella has plans. They don't include Duncan, who takes a stolen no ship and bails this party with Shiana, Miles, Teg, the uh, Telalala, and a thousand years of important DNA, leaving with a cliffhanger and a bunch of unanswered questions. I cannot wait to see what Frank Herbert has planned in the next. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Dang. By the way, Ken. I don't think you have to say it's Marbella Idaho. I don't think they ever got married. They're just living in sin. History will call them wives. Yes, (laughs) that's right. Um, It is very sad to, I mean, to to end on the, that note, because particularly, I don't know if this is in your copies of chapter house Dune, but mine has this very lovely tribute by Frank Herbert to his wife. And this is the last uh, thing, I guess that Frank Herbert wrote about Dune before his death. Yeah, yeah, I I know what you're talking about. I was also going to ask what the question was with Daniel and Marty, but uh, oh my god, I, I, which is also a nice little tribute in my opinion. So tribute to what? I I feel like there's a lot of uh, question about whether or not that was supposed to be a little bit of a uh, tribute to Frank and Bever- Beverly. Yeah, Beverly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was basically sort of in the Frank sense that some people her, her. theorize that Tom Bombadil is supposed to be like Tolkien himself. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Yes. This is sort of sort of existing apart from the reality that he created. <laughs> yes. Uh, the the moment that the moment that that ends, I sit there and I and I said to myself, "Huh, he wrote himself into his book after all." <laughs> And David was, Lynch shows up in the movie as a minor. Oh, yeah, Frank Herbert does. shows up as a face dancer. So there you go. And it was mostly seen as, I mean, he wrote this book after Beverly had died. And so it was mostly seen as an attempt to put him and Beverly in the movie. Him probably realizing his time was limited. And yeah, basically it was a nice little epitaph saying, here's what we gave you. Go enjoy. Now we're out of here, you know, type thing. Which is a nice way to look at it. I don't know if that was actually the way it was written. I think Brian Herbert kind of substantiated uh, some of that talk. Uh, I don't know if he officially substantiated it or if it was more of a, yeah, sure, it sounds like a nice story. I'll go with it type yeah. thing. But Do we want to start the at the end thing. here or do we want to – how how do we how, how are we going to talk about this book? I, I, the summary should suggest just how bonkers it is to people who are Todd, tuning into this. Todd, I my part. It's all you now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my my first question that I had for both of you was, what did what did you think? You came away with this book. Is this a book that you say, yeah, I recommend it, or the book that you say, you know, all the rest of them are really good. You can avoid this one if you want. I, what did you think? I Jack, do you want to kick it off? I yeah, I just I I think I have to say that this is this was definitely the hardest one to get through. I there's yeah, I just couldn't really. Uh, so in our in our the Heretics of Dune episode, I, I recounted how upon my first time reading the book, I, I couldn't figure out exactly what was happening or what the sort of through line was or the thematic 
intent of the book. And then suddenly halfway through, I, 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 ha- I kind of had a, an awakening to what it was about, which was na- namely the sort of difficulty of, in- of persisting with traditions and the, and the, and the problem of institutional survival over time. I could not figure out exactly what Chapter House Dune was about, and I still can't. I mean, I understand the plot, <laughs> more or less. I mean, again, as Ken Summary suggested, there's there's a lot going on, but I just couldn't... There's much, yeah. Uh, I, I could not quite discern what the thematic intention of this book was. I guess there's some some bits of the same Heretics of Dune theme of just institutional memory and whatnot, especially with the fact that the Bene Gesserit are literally transforming their home world into Dune. And just the, the, and the fact that the, the fact, the fact that they've survived all this time and are basically just continuing to try to survive in the face of yet another threat. This one, a true threat, as, as someone says in the book, the, they were kind of actually, they and Leto, the second God Emperor kind of had the same, goal ultimately it's just that leto was was a was a jealous uh adherent to the golden path and he just kind of wanted to sideline the bene Gesserit. whereas yes. the 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 honored matres just genuinely want to exterminate the Gesserit. but yeah I, I, but anyway well, at I least saw, absorb absorb them they absorb yeah right like make the, them a functional like the non-entity yeah yeah you've got you've got technology and abilities that we want and we don't want to take the time to learn them we'll just take them from you yeah exactly basically so yeah, so, that was that was my problem. Is just there was a lot going on, and I I couldn't the things happen in in a sequence that uh, that unfolds in a plot in the way that books work. But I just couldn't I couldn't exactly see where Frank Herbert was going, and and now we'll never know exactly where he was going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ken, how about you? Your initial impressions? I felt like there were several times during this book that I thought, why do I care? There was so yeah. much talking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, lots of talking. This is all. There's of, always been a bit of this in the Dune books, but th- there has there, and this well, this sort and, of doubled down on it. And and in any novel, you're going to find a lot of exposition and a lot of of uh, world building and such. A lot of a lot of the uh, details filled in. You're going to find that there was a lot of a lot of stuff going on with the uh, Bene Gesserit that I felt was very, if you've read the Wheel of Time, very Aes Sedai like where it was just a lot of what's going on in the day to day and why do I even care? Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, there's like an extensive section discussing the, the fruit that they're growing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> at the, yeah. And at the base of every tree is an, is a reverend mother buried so that she can feed that tree. I'm <laughs> eating one of my re- former reverend mothers. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't they that. have all these reverend mothers in their memories too? How does the reverend mother feel about being eaten? <laughs> uh, I'm eating you. I'm please, please show that. a little respect. But it, at the same time, I did, I did see a lot of themes, and it felt like it was kind of Frank Herbert's uh, themes' greatest hits. Like in yeah. Dune, there was a lot of you know how we treat the indigenous folk, and there was a lot of environmental stuff, and it felt like he was basically trying to get out a lot of his grievances, not necessarily so overtly as he used to but they were all still there like for example the we're turning this lush planet into a desert for the for the uh, sole reason of getting the getting the riches that the sandworm can provide we are so we're destroying our planet we're uh, exterminating all of one people so that we can ex- absorb what they have we're uh, fighting against autocracy which is in the name of democracy that sort of you know sort of stuff where in the sense that the uh, honored matres absorbed the face dancers or not the, the fish speakers excuse me and and took that uh, power and, and just kind of absorbed it and it, it seemed like there was there were a lot of a lot of grievances or a lot of things that frank herbert was trying to get in before or while he still could basically yeah you know one of the things that um as i as i read through the book what i felt like uh, what I, and I mentioned to you guys earlier when we were chatting about uh, building a morgue, 
of, uh, of, of comments and posts that maybe you'd like to send out, but you're thinking, well, this isn't the right time or they're not the right, they're not the right platform. I, I kind of feel like, uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, as I've been, as I've been working on my second novel, uh, and the first novel was not published. So please don't look. And the second novel may never be published either. So please don't look, um, yet. Uh, but the a gentleman that I've been getting some coaching from said, make a morgue, build a morgue. And every time you make changes, copy all of the things that you wrote before, put them in the morgue because you never know when you're going to use them again. And with that in mind, I kind of feel like some of the dialogue, some of the conversation, all he did was take those from earlier incarnations and change names. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And so, see that. See that. Mm-hmm. and so some of the conversation, for, for instance, my personal, I, I, and maybe, maybe this makes me a sick human, but my, I think my favorite chapter in the entire thing was chapter 17, the interrogation of Lucilla by great honored Matra Dharma. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was, a good I we, we got that chapter. So I remember complaining in Heretics of Dune that the honored Matres are seen as this great threat but like half the times they appear someone just like instantly defeats them and then yeah. in this book yeah. they are much more of a threat like i can yes. they, they are much more intimidating in fact i in my copy of uh of chapter house i have the this will be impossible for anyone to see but there's the spider woman on the on the cover oh cool oh, nice um so i think this is the original run paperback version okay it has a okay. 1985 public that's version. Anyway, that would be it then. That would be it. Yeah, because 85 was when it came out. Yeah. Uh, but I, as I look at it, I kind of feel like he threw together a loose story and said, I have I have these pieces that I felt very passionate needed to be expressed. I, uh, while we were while we were do, reading this, uh, this particular book, I also looked up some old interviews that Frank Herbert had done. Uh, and in one of them, he said, I'm always, in, he says, my, my friends from the Middle East are always surprised that my book is categorized as science fiction. They think it should be categorized as religious con- commentary. Oh. Which yeah. I also can see, uh, especially with the insertion of uh, the rabbi, which gets, <laughs> I mean, and, and let's be fair. You've had five books. You've you've had the opportunity to introduce this line of of uh, cooperation before, and you've never done it until now. <laughs> Come on! Are there so you you guys were much better than I was at at noticing the the hints about the ex lottle tanks, um, and how they're the, the 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 fact that they turned out to be just wombs basically was was the predicate was laid for that. Are yeah. there any hints whatsoever about? the the jewish people having continued to exist in continuity with their past in in the the only clue that i can find the only clue that i can find is a reference and i'm trying to remember whether it was in children of dune or dune messiah that says we have built religions for our use uh and we have allowed some religions to continue to exist and others we have squashed oh yeah i remember that and that's the only, but but they don't say why. They don't say which religions. They just say they just throw that piece out. And I'm kind of like, was that was was that a was 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 that you putting a little place marker in some place where you could say, and if I decided that it's going to be the Jews, if I decide that it's going to be the Protestants, if I decide that it's going to be the Catholics, if I decide that it's going to be the Greek Orthodox, if I decide that it's, it, come on. I mean, <laughs> I, I, um, I, one of the, one of the things that has been expanded upon in a lot of this stuff um, is the, the connection and they, and they reference this over and over in the last two books, the Zen Sunni combination mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, especially with the the uh, Benet Lelax, that you know they they have these two traditions, the Sunni tradition and the Zen tradition, both of which emphasize peace, but both of which are kind of, I mean, they don't fit together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they just kind of went and yeah. squished them. And yeah, but with, with the Zen Sunni tradition, you really see that that quote you just mentioned. You really see why the Benet Gesserit allowed certain religions to continue to exist because 
uh, Skytel is being constantly manipulated by oh, uh, yeah. by Bene Gesserit who are like, oh, well, I happen to know your doctrine. And he's like, oh, she knows my doctrine. And then he's like, oh, okay, what do you want me to do now? <laughs> yeah. And then, well, and then, and then four pages later, he's like, and they, they did it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> Those darn Bene Gesserit. It felt like a Scooby-Doo moment every yeah. time. Those darn kids and their darn <laughs> dog. Would have got, got away with it too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those those witches and that blasted Gola um, is is kind of. How, I guess that makes Gola. I, I guess that makes Duncan Idaho actually Scooby Doo. Um, so uh, with with that in mind, it sounds that like all of us. How Scooby Doo has survived all this time? <laughs> Scooby Doo is a Gola. Uh, somebody's going to say Merbella that is a phrase that has probably never been spoken by anybody in history before. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to find myself staring down assassins after that. So it sounds like it sounds like all of us have reasons to say, yeah, this isn't the greatest in, the greatest installment in the Dune franchise. But you know, if there's if if you're hankering for some Frank Herbert, then you know, go ahead, yeah, pick it up, read it. Does it really does it really kind of put an end on the story for you guys, or does it did it just was it just a, a vehicle for? Uh, for for putting more information out, one of the one of the criteria that well, I'll, I'll shut up. I'll let you guys respond to that. What do you think? No, by the, by the end of it, it felt like it was deliberately designed to, to drive one more book, which makes sense because that was Frank Herbert's plan all along. Um, so they say that he was going to have a seventh book, and and I mean they found notes uh, on floppy disks leading to that yeah. back so, in the 80s back in the 80s well yeah i mean they they really did they found his his old notes yeah they were in like a, ba- a safety after, deposit box a safe deposit box long after he had yep. died they found him on floppy disk that that had a, a rough outline and everything so i mean he was planning on making a seventh book and very much it's now that i think about it, it's kind of like the god emperor's journals in a way oh, a little bit oh. interesting comparison are we on the golden path <laughs> um i oh. gosh i hope not Heavens if we know. if we are, we're in a lot of trouble. Um, if this is the golden path. I want to go back. <laughs> yeah, and and it's it's worth noting. Uh, and I and I did kind of mention this is the this is a kind of the the end of the Frank Herbert stuff with Dune. But then Brian Herbert and uh, Kevin J. Kevin Anderson, Anderson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. pick it up and run with two more books: Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune. Sandworms. Sandworms of Dune. Yeah. Have either of you? Uh, either of you have any interest in pursuing the story beyond what we've done up to this point in time? So I will, I, I'll answer both that question and the question you asked about uh, whether the story felt complete or not in, in chapter house, because I have a sort of combined assessment here. I think my answer to your, your the first question you asked is both yes and no, because I can see some clear, obvious setups for future stories in this book. There's uh, the, the obvious one to me is well there, there's a couple one is the fact that there's these hints that the the honored matres who are kind of this this now as fully established as this fearsome force who are trying to basically obliterate and absorb the Bene Gesserit, they're actually running from something else yes what the heck are they running from it, it, it reminded me i i should have looked this up because i can't remember now i feel like there's some historical instance of Maybe it was the the Huns, the Huns invade Rome, or not? Not I, I'm going to mangle the history. Whatever it is, some some tribe or some people uh, overwhelming a different group because they're actually running from somebody else. This is actually something that's happened in history where like yeah. you everyone assumes that they're the bad guys, but they're actually fleeing an even worse, uh, even worse force. Uh, what was that? I don't know. We we don't we we certainly don't learn in this book. I would like to know. I'm very curious, <laughs> especially given that the threat the the honored matres pose and and how yeah. how frightened they are by and how like sort of skittish they are whenever it's someone asks them about this. They're just kind of like, mm, we're not going to talk about this. Um, so there's that that hint, and then there's the Daniel and Marty. <laughs> there's this mysterious old couple whom only is it only. Duncan, who can see them? Is that right? As far that as we're aware of, yeah. As far as we, so see they them. they appear. Duncan, who by the way, Duncan uh, and Marbella spend most, and and uh, and Skytel spend most of this book just inside of a ship, as yeah, as guests. 
like this we'll bizarre, the, the most bizarre sitcom you can ever imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Just the three of them, st- or maybe the most bizarre reality TV show you can ever imagine. That's probably a better. <laughs> Sounds like the start of a joke. Yeah, they're just the, the it's like Big Brother Dune where they're they're, they're just constantly being monitored and hanging out. Two but of they... them are having sex and the other one just sits on the side as the permanent third wheel. Hey, right. what are you guys doing? <laughs> you want to hang out? Uh, <laughs> so they're they're just in the ship the most this time and but but the the most interesting thing in Duncan's life aside from the sex that he has is occasionally he gets these visions of this old couple who are just in this garden somewhere and they seem to be going about their life, their their lives, and then suddenly they they look back at him and they're like, "Oh, can he see us? That's weird. He's not supposed to do that." And Duncan is just meanwhile like, "What the heck is going on? Who are they? And why am I seeing them?" And and the book even ends with the two of them having yes. this very fourth wall breaking conversation about about Duncan once they once his he and his crew uh, take off uh, peace out as the kids say these days. Uh, from from the whatever's going on and then that's it we don't know we have no idea who these people are we we don't have a clue and that seems we know they like roses that's true we know that (laughs) but that that seems to be one of the most uh obvious hints that there was that frank herbert had something else coming we we have we'll have no clue what it was uh so that that's my that's my yes and no Oh, that's the yes, or the, the, that's the no of whether I felt like the the book uh, was a was a satisfactory or uh, kept kept the story going, and uh, that that there was more coming. the The way in which it was satisfied. So, if the whole point of the Golden Path is just to kind of ensure that mankind's future remains mm-hmm. uh, un- undetermined and mysterious, and immune from and like not dependent on a single source for something. I want to I want to find the exact uh, quote here, but I'm going to keep talking as I do. Here we go. Then then the the way that Duncan and his crew leave everything in their ship with the guy with the the tube of of DNA for all of these important characters in it and stuff. We're on an unidentifiable ship, unidentifiable ship in an unidentifiable universe. Idaho said, "Isn't that what we wanted?" I mean, that is kind of a, a an interest a good and fitting way for doomed to conclude you just have this group of people who have the resources to continue this mysterious journey and they're they're beyond the reach of their enemies and they're going out into somewhere in the universe we have no idea where but they they have the wherewithal to keep to keep this sort of morsel of hope alive and so even if like this there were no uh there were no attempt to continue this series after this point it, it it is kind of just a, a fitting way to include to know that they're out there somewhere doing something. Yeah. We hope they're yes. they're they're keeping the 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 hope alive, but we're not sure. But this is kind of what it, the whole the whole golden path has been precarious ever since the ever since it was first introduced into the Dune universe, and to just continue it on this precarious pathway seems uh, seems appropriate. But as for yeah. as for as for whether I am interested in. Continuing on the last two books that are in this continuity, I own a copy of Hunters of Dune. I'm just not, I haven't been able to bring myself to read it. I'm just not yeah. sure if I want to. Um, but there are obvious reasons to want to know, like, who the heck uh, Daniel and Marty were and what the heck the Bene- or the Honored Montres were so afraid of and what's going to happen to Duncan, whether yeah. there will be another Duncan Gola. <laughs> yeah. or whether this will be the last Duncan uh, I doubt it I doubt it um, there are because, reasons to continue but anyway yeah I I, I think for me uh, Jack in, in reference to what you were mentioning I if if we look at Dune not as a not as a story of the characters but as a story of of humankind becoming both too satisfied uh, too soft uh, too um, too dedicated, too connected to uh, the way things are, and uh-huh. not uh, not embracing of re- the real adventure, which is finding out what human potential is all about, uh, which is really what what the golden path was about. Let's bring out the best in humanity, um, and the the scattering was about that. Um, the Bene Gesserit's uh, manipulation of uh, of of uh, genetic lines was all about bringing about somebody that could 
put us on the golden path. Uh, unfortunately, the one who put us on the golden path, according to them, the tyrant, uh, was unprepared to let us be on the golden path, made it his golden path, where we just keep everybody even more satisfied. And when he finally dies and it releases us to be uh, free and unfettered and explore, um, for me, that is, this this last book concludes that. And it says, we, we started you with a question. And the question was, how do we handle situations where we know that our entire lives are determined? Uh, we get Paul, we get Leto, we get all of these kinds of things. And now we've brought it to a place where none of us can be determined because they're completely unknown. I liked that aspect of it. As far as feeling, um, as far as my feeling of satisfied um, and, and do I want to, do I want to continue to explore? I'm kind of of two minds. Um, they're, and they're kind of in the same, same line you are. I am curious about what could be so frightening to the honored matres. Um, but I'm also curious as to how somebody else would interpret all of Frank's ideas and then puts them into a new direction and whether or not it would be a continuation of that, or it's a complete reinvention. And I'm not sure I'm willing, I'm not sure that I'm excited about jumping in because right. I've invested so much in this other direction. Brian Herbert actually, so all I've read of Hunters of Dune is his introduction, Brian Herbert's introduction to it, which talks a little bit about exactly what you just mentioned, which is, and he, I think he admits basically, this will not be exactly what my father would have written because I am not my father. I mean, I, yeah. I, I have the, I have this resource of his notes to draw from, but I, I, I'm inevitably going to fill in gaps and interpolate things and, uh, it's not going to be the same exact thing. So yeah. th there will inevitably be some of his own vision and sort of mixed in with, his, with his, with what his father imagined. So I, I don't know how he went about doing that. Cause again, I haven't brought myself to actually go through hunters of Dune and Sandworm, sandworms of Dune yet. And, f and, and to be in, in, in interest of full disclosure, I have read some of the prequel stuff. Uh, the the uh, Butlerian Jihad trilogy. I've read no two relation. of the three books on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wrote so I wrote a, a an essay in National Review magazine about Dune, and I managed to include that as a parenthetical, which I am, which I think is really funny. I, I say <laughs> the Butlerian Jihad parentheses no relation. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a, that's just a real that's a, that's real self indulgent of me, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna embrace it. It is it. That, it I will say this: there was a lot more punching in those books than there was in all of Dune combined. Uh, of course, I think those books were each about 700 pages long, so maybe they were as yeah. long as all of Dune combined. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some. I think for people that are really invested in this universe and in some of these characters, certainly not Duncan Idaho because he doesn't show up. Uh, maybe in, in in hunters and and sandworms he does, but I but I but I also recognize and I also respect people who would say you know what this was Frank's work, it's done, um, and and let it go. He didn't pick Brian, he didn't inform Brian, he didn't make it Brian a successor or Kevin a successor. Um, let it you know let it be done. So kind of interesting. I feel like he kind of, I feel like he kind of did, or at least he would be okay with with Brian of all people. Uh, picking up the ball and running with it since, I mean, that's his own, that's his own flesh and blood, but <laughs> well, and well they, and we know how Leto felt about flesh and blood. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and, and Brian and Frank collaborated on stories before and, and all that. Sure. A and looking at the wheel of time, you can see how, how a, an unfinished work can be picked up and finished successfully, even if it yes. doesn't sound quite the same. I mean, Brandon had a, a, a lot different uh, tone than, than Robert yes. Jordan had. So I'm not worried about that at all. I, I just feel like I'm kind of done. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I'm, I am, I am interested to see where, uh, at least where hunters and sandworms takes it. Uh, uh and I think for that, me, it's, eh. yeah, for me, it's one of those where I'm saying to myself, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to let this age like kimchi for a little while buried in the ground and fermenting yeah. and then maybe when i come back to it it'll it'll be it'll be uh, spicy and ripe enough that i'll be ready to try it again 
Yep. There are other things I'd like to get to, and then maybe I'll get back to hunters and sandworms. We'll see. Sure. We'll see. So let me ask this question. Um, were there any scenes? Uh, so we've talked about this book as kind of a, a hodgepodge of a lot of different ideas that are kind of kicking around. I mentioned my favorite scene, uh, or one of my favorite scenes, is the interview between Lucilla and Dharma. Did you guys have any 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 scenes or sections of the book that you said, you know what, it was worth wading through all of the other stuff to get to this moment? Were there any of those in this book for you guys? Hmm. I know which one it was not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, we're not going to talk about it. I <laughs> I did like the scene. Well, it seemed like all Duncan and Marbella did on set, on screen was or on the page was talk. So That's either before or after, yeah. it was like two lines that say, and they copulated, and then there's and talking then, before and, and talking after. Talking, yeah, and then there's a bunch of pillow talk in between. Talking but, before they're irritated, talking after they're sweaty, but you know, I. I liked, I actually, and this might, you know, come as a surprise from being from me, but I actually liked their discussions about love and what love was and are we in love? Are we addicted to each other? Blah, 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 you know, whatever. And so, okay. The details maybe were a little bit boring, but the concept I liked. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh my goodness, Ken, that's just beautiful. It was, <laughs> it was it was the idea that uh, why does it have to be one or the other? You know, it's like oh, we're just addicted based on our our uh, our proclivities match up so well and they tie us together or whatever. Sometimes that's just what love is, man. I mean, love. <laughs> I I feel like I feel like people have this uh, misconception that love is this immediate triggering sensation of I see this person and now I am in love with them or whatever. Uh, love takes time and love takes work. And sometimes there are other things that go into it uh, besides just the, the physical animalistic emotion of love, you know, and I think Jack, now we know why he had to close the door before we started this because he doesn't want Jolene to hear any of this. That's right. <laughs> well, she's not even home. So, but, but the, <laughs> The point is love is not just a physical thing. Love takes work. And I think without touching on it, they still touched on the idea that just because it might not have started out as love, they could be in love. So all, okay. all that I need to know from Dune about romance, I got from God Emperor of Dune. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I, so that was that was partly a joke, but I actually did f find deeply amusing the I think in God Emperor of Dune that the quote that the God Emperor says is something like uh, when he's talking about Hui Nori he says something like uh, she reminds me of the Butlerian Jihad in the most poignant way, and this is meant to be like this incredibly romantic statement. Uh, I I actually read through that passage for the first time when I was reading God Emperor of Dune the first time. It was right around uh, Valentine's Day, <laughs> I think of 2018, and I just thought I was. I imagine I was. That got me thinking of of creating a, a compilation of Dune Valentines. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me you didn't send any of them. No, no, I didn't. I didn't, and I, I didn't. I had not. I've not bothered to compile a list of them beyond beyond that one. So. Yeah. So my, my, if if it was love, so given that I have already learned everything I need to know about romance from God Emperor of Dune, the the thing that I really took away from <laughs> thematically, to the extent I could discern a real a, a real thematic through line in in ch uh, Chapter House, it was the uh, comments made by various characters about bureaucracies and how yeah. bureaucracy can be this suppressive force that kind of takes on a life of its own, becomes an aristocracy, leaves things in a fixed position becomes an end unto itself frank herbert very anti-bureaucratic individual just yep. very very much not a man of system very much opposed to anything that kind of uh fixes things in their place and and leads to stagnation uh that that so that that in in the sense that you were talking about chapter of student is this kind of collection of various themes and conversations perhaps excised from other books and that ended up here. I, I, I think this is something that is a consistent through line of all of the Dune books. And I, I again, found it a, a, a appealing and attractive in this one. Yeah. Uh, I know for, for me, you know, as I, as I mentioned that one, that one chapter gave me more stuff to chew on 
um, about uh, the nature of the nature of politics, the nature of the development of democracies, and and how they how they rise, how they fall, how they succeed, how they fail. Um, I in fact I I one of the quotes that I wrote down: politics, the art of appearing candid and completely open while concealing as much as possible. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, that is that is why um, when when I am in uh, certain kinds of political conversations. Uh, I wind up I wind up really struggling because I have uh, I I do the candid part I don't do the concealing part very well <laughs> sometimes and uh, I was I was very impressed by that and got a lot of stuff out of it. Um, it was his I, line by the way it was his line about fish speaker democracy turning into honored matre autocracy and I thought oh man we're there yeah <laughs> Frank Herbert saw it we're there holy cow. I I kind of wonder if uh, you know this shouldn't be if maybe that maybe that conversation there's you know there's a few there's a few standout pieces on uh, political theory that I think should be required of everyone to read. There's a portion from Starship Troopers uh, about the responsibility of of investing in society. Uh, you know, there's obviously some some writings by the founding fathers or those who those philosophers who influenced them, and then that chapter by Frank Herbert. I think those should be. A, a, a poli sci class. If I could control <laughs> one, I would say poli political science from literature. Let's talk about these, and I'd throw those out. I political think science fun. fiction. Ooh, oh, maybe I can do that. Uh, I'm actually, I'm actually interviewing for a position where I might have a chance at a political science class. Maybe I can get away with it. Oh, probably not. Go. Yeah, probably not. Um, so I, I want to ask you. I want to ask a question. The battle scene at the end that takes like four chapters. Uh, did you guys enjoy that? Was that one that you enjoyed, or was that one that you kind of went, "What"? Uh, there were some interesting parts of it. I, I kind of the again, I'll, I'll use my my visual display here, which will be great for the it'll be great for the YouTubers, but bad for the podcast listeners. I have the uh, the ten year old Miles Tag sort of on on who is this? Who is carrying him again? I can't remember. Streggy. Streggy. Oh, Streggy, right. right. This, yeah, this sort of random Ben Jesuit <laughs> who shows up. Yeah, and 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 carries him around and allows him to like be the Miles Tag we know from from Heretics of Dune. But as a ten, does that make boy, Streggy his war horse? It makes. It makes I don't his know. Hodor. I have no idea. I lo so that was a, like when I when I first got this this copy of the book and I was just sort of looking at it. I, I saw that spine image and I was like. What the heck is that? is that? How well? How is that going to be? Is this depicting something in the book? And yeah, it turns out yes. As a matter of fact, um, there were plenty so, of what the heck moments in this book for me. By the way, <laughs> Sarah, are you sure you don't want to talk about them more? <laughs> well, I mean, starting with the space juice, that was one of those. Wait, what? And uh, Sightail showing up and me going, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, there were there were several of these, and then you know, of course, uh, Shiana and uh, and the awakening of Miles Tag. I'm like, <laughs> what? Um, now you said you didn't want to talk about that, but you brought it up again. Do we need to talk about that? I don't know. If you guys can talk about it if you want, but I, other than the to say that I was disturbed at the detail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to to uh, say that Shiana, I mean, and everybody knew it was coming. Everybody knows exactly how a, a Bene Gesserit awakens Agola. You know. <laughs> So it wasn't a surprise that that was. They give him cotton but, candy. That's yeah, what they do. And a puppy, right? Um, <laughs> so, but the the detail was a little disturbing, especially in the uh, post Me Too. Uh, everybody's. Yeah, this is a, this is a ten year old kid like, we're talking about. Yeah, he's yeah. even though so, he we transform him into a, a adult Miles Tag, mm -hmm. and yeah, grown it's just very. Body, but... It's strange that he his. When once he's awakened, he he object he objects to it, but not exactly in the way you would you would think. It, it's it's just kind of like a stop it, woman. What are you doing? Not a like, hey, aren't I ten years old? Right. <laughs> can you stop? Can you stop? Uh, All of this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All no, of I this. Mean, I I feel like this is going to get you on some uh, predators list around the galaxy for. <laughs> The galactic predator list. Well, yeah, who's who's exactly. gonna who's gonna arrest a Bene Gesserit? Let's be honest. What's An what are, who's... <laughs> a Maybe Zotrak. that's. I, I mean, we we would worry about like we we would be worried about the the Bene Gesserit uh, violating sex 
uh, laws, but the not the honored. If that's the crime, the honored Montres are not going to be the ones to arrest them. Let's be honest. Right. <laughs> those who can't, those who are only listening, uh, can't see that Craig has just returned to the recording and is now laughing and is very confused by the, the, this. The, is the, this being the point where he came back. That's right. The, the question that I have is, Craig, is do you have somebody in the? You have, you have one of your kids in the room with you. He does, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Yikes. So anyway, maybe they're, they're maybe way you too can... young to understand what you guys are talking about. So I think we're good. Okay, good. In that case, we'll keep going. The, <laughs> the idea of it written 35 years ago was disturbing enough to see something like it, to the see of something like that written these days, and the uh, the furor that it would the, the furor, Frank Herbert would have been arrested. Furor that it would have uh, arisen, would, or at least at least called out by the moral majority and say you're a horrible human being. Oh my goodness. But the the aftermath, though, I always I thought was fun, too, in the sense that all of a sudden 10 year old Miles Tegg can, you know, move at the speed of thought for a brief second, you know, and then he needs food, and, you know, stuff. Like oh, yeah. That. Like every 10 year old. I can, well, I can that, that's kind of a, that's kind of a I, I believe that the I haven't actually seen any of the uh, DC Universe movies that have the flash in them. But I think yes. they have this detail as well, where the Flash just has to consume thousands of calories all the time. Yes, and as he's someone always who, eating. As someone who ran uh, cross country in college and it still runs a good deal, this is this is a true to life detail. You do need a lot yeah. of calories. Uh, so that's that's funny. Oh yeah, this is it, and that that's in that's in Heretics of Dune as well. After Miles has his original Matrix moment, yes. he just goes to this like diner and. And someone and t says like I need basically he does the sort of Ron Swanson I need all the bacon I need and eggs all that the you bacon have. and all the eggs that yeah. you have exactly <laughs> it's, it seemed like he said I need one of everything yeah yeah shall was... we bring you more yes yeah but start with one of everything just just keep it coming so that was a nice little callback to Heretics but it was also it also made sense in the sense that here is here is grown up mind in a ten year old body who cannot physically do what you will be able to do when you are grown up <laughs> yeah yeah. So well, I the other thing interesting, but I, I got a kick out of several times when they made when they made mention of the fact that Miles was delivering these commands in a 10 year old voice. <laughs> right. And he was like, I'm still having a hard time with this. I hope everyone else is executing my <laughs> instructions. The only thing that I could just better was uh, was a voice cracking, you know, during <laughs> one of the... <laughs> that, that that'll, that'll in happen full, in full Peter Brady mode. You know, I, I'm sure that happens in Hunters. Um <laughs> So uh, one of the scenes that I found, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm I'm not sure it's interesting, but it was one of those moments where I said, okay, um, I think I, I I think I have a different perspective now. Was Mabella's experience with the water of life, and I kept thinking about Duncan's experience being awakened as a gola. And the similarities between the idea of the Gola accessing all of those previous life memories and Mabella getting access to previous life memories. Did either of you find that kind of enlightening or did you say, yeah, OK, not really my cup of tea, not what I was looking for? I seem to I, I keep trying to remember the uh, her uh, spice agony moment and I think. All I keep going back to is I don't remember a lot of it, which I think means I wish there had been more detail about it. Okay. So you know what I mean, because I, I don't yeah. I remember that chapter came up and I remember she went through the spice agony and that she had all the memories. And I remember thinking, well, her getting these memories and, and becoming a Bene Gesserit after being an honored Matre is going to play a big part in. Yeah. Uh, and, and turns out I was prescient, but um Wow, you use, do you use that ability for anything else? No, that's pretty much all. Ken I is the Quizots how to rock. It's just a one-off on random, <laughs> inconsequential things. But anyway, my point is, I didn't. I felt like I wanted more detail about what the spice agony entails, and I okay because I don't Mer remember a ton of it. So, so Marbella is interesting because I mean, within I don't know a span of fifty pages in this book, she's suddenly one of the most powerful and important individuals in the known universe. <laughs> yeah. And that is clearly, we were, we were talking earlier about things that were being set up and whether we were, we felt like the story was satisfactory and its conclusion or whether we wanted to know more. I definitely want to know like, what, what is she, she's obviously going to be of significance in the, at least one of the subsequent 
two books that are meant yeah. to be in, the, in yeah. this continuity. I, I don't know exactly how, but clearly she's being set up for some important role because now she's the, the, the Ben Jester and the Honored Matres have been combined through her. Like she's the, she's the keystone of these she's two, the Nexus, right. these two previously warring factions. And so that, that's gotta be, that, that has to be, uh, that, that gives her a lot of power. Just obviously having be, being one of the only people, uh, to, who, who draws from these two disparate traditions and like, what's she going to do? What, what are, what are the combined forces of these two organizations going to go up against in the, ne- in the next books? I don't know. We, we just don't know. Well, not only that, she's got access to futars. Oh yeah. We haven't talked we haven't about even those. talked about yet. So we got to talk about that. <laughs> and she has access to, uh, uh, Tillalaxu, uh, Gola producing, uh, and stuff. So, Oh yeah. She's, she's really consolidated all of, all of the power centers in just this one person all of a sudden. And it feels like all of those are done. And it feels like Odrade. We haven't talked very much about Odrade. She, she kind of feels like um, in, in this book, at least she kind of feels like she's uh, setting this. She's, she's setting the stage uh, for someone else. And of course, I mean, she is for Odrade and for Shiana. She's setting up those, these two different pieces. Um, but it's interesting that that as she's going through this process, she seems to recognize uh, along the way that if the honored, honored Matres are coming in and trying to gather everything from the old Imperium, that there has to be a reason for it. And so in setting up Mabella to be the one that has uh, the concentration of all of the power, all of the Honored Matre power, all of the uh, old Imperium power, we have then a unified force that can fight whatever this new enemy really is. And in this way, it feels like it finally moves beyond um, the, the sci- this, this piece finally moves beyond uh, the, the science fiction of what happens with human beings in this far flung future where we're all over the place to a more traditional science fiction. What happens when humans go against aliens? Do we know if it's aliens? We don't. Aliens. But that, that's kind of what it feels like. It feels like they're saying, "Oh, this is something so much different, so much fright- more frightening." I I have the feeling tentacles will be involved and probably heat rays and all that kind of stuff. It's good. <laughs> Craig made I, a funny face when you said tentacles will be involved. I I I do it just to see if I can still surprise him once in a while. So I think is it? I think it's going to be the mother futar. <laughs> yeah, the futars. Let's talk about them. Not to be confused with futons. Uh, I, very different things, or chair or, dogs, or chair dogs. <laughs> I wanted to make a, uh, I wanted to make a futar fight reference between the Bene Gesserit and the Honored Matres in my recap, and I just couldn't make it work. I, I have to confess, I looked up, uh, I, I decided to look up uh, futar. Um, I don't recommend anybody do that ever, ever, okay. because there were some. <laughs> Um, I well the the way that you type in the word um, brings up other kinds of references, and I was like, none of this I need to ever have known about. So, <laughs> if you're if if you're out there and you are bored and want to you know burn your eyes with with and your and your soul, uh, or maybe you think those things are fun, whichever is whichever is your cup of tea. Like um, degrees, apparently. Uh, yeah, an awful lot, an awful lot. But this idea that they were somehow genetically, and again, going back to what the what the Bene Gesserit are all about, the manipulation of genes and of genetic lines, to set up this process where we have uh, basically werewolves, were cats, uh, if we will, humanoid cats. Um, I mean, kind of like Paw Patrol, but uh, on a vicious level where they're eat, you know, they they are unleashed as a weapon to eat. I, I was thinking more like if if either of you, have, if any of you have seen the uh, Scooby in the in the late nineties, we talked about Scooby Doo already, <laughs> believe it or not. But in the late nineties, there was this series of like pseudo realistic Scooby Doo movies where the, yes. the monsters were real. Yeah. The, the first of them was the Zombie Island one. Yes, and there, there's those cat people that show up. Yes, uh, that that's kind of what I I have in mind of the futars being. Yeah, um, vicious, uh, predatory hunters um, that are controlled by handlers who can, can you know make them do you know make con- control all of their murderous impulses or release all of their murderous impulses by the use of pheromones. I mean, 
this is one of those places where I was kind of like, Frank, what, were you sitting a little too close to a Star Trek episode at some point in time? Because <laughs> this this one this one went weird even for you. He had just finished the Island of Doctor Moreau and was inspired. <laughs> good reference, Ken. Good reference. Fortunately for him, the film adaptation uh, of the '90s had not yet come out yet. Right. Oh, oh, oh my, oh my. Uh, the, no, just the, the comic book version. <laughs> the the infamous Val Kilmer uh, Marlon Brando Marlon collaboration. Brando, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, so much so much potential, <laughs> and not. Um, do do we feel like um, do we do we feel like we've talked about all of the really important stuff in this book? I mean, it's just kind of such a scattered deal. Is there anything that you guys want to talk about that we haven't talked about? We probably missed three or four points, and we don't even know it because there were so many. <laughs> there was so much stuff in this book. Well, I think we should talk a little. If I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, so that this has actually been a creeping phenomenon throughout the series since the first book, which is the ever loosening uh, proscriptions against technology. And the the Butlerian oh, yeah. Jihad came, seems to be weakening over time. Yeah, and in fact, it's it comes out. I think in this book that the someone they, there's a discussion about the fact that Cyborgs. the God Emperor never let the Ixians keep doing their thing, and he just kind of wanted them to keep to keep at it. And I, I think that the so I, I'm kind of cheating here actually because I I've I've gathered b- bits and pieces. I do not. I think the aliens thing is wrong. I think it's actually what the threat that that is being faced is a sort of book ending if you if you count the prequels as chronologically proceeding as the, as you should. There's a kind of book ending resurgence of machines as a of threat. thinking machines. Uh that they return as the malevolent force. Uh, okay. As I'd buy that. To aliens. I'd see that. I'd buy so, that. But th- th- this is kind of interesting. Is so, so why if that if that's if that is what happens, then why why is there this why is the the universe wide attitude against machines gradually weakening? Why is what is what is the the gist or the point of that that going on? Yeah, you know, um, I, I I caught a couple of glimpses on that, and I think it I think it's hinted at in the uh, diminishing reserves of spice. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. The big, the big portion of, uh, and and the big reason that um, that uh, machines still exist, right? Um, yeah, one you of the, have basic machines for the most you, part, but not, nothing, the, not, nothing like a computer. Artificial intelligence, in specifics, was what was, and anything that can, anything that can resemble the computational abilities of a human mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, what they call it in the in the. Uh, in the books are the thinking machines. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one of the contentions that they made was that the use of spice was what allowed navigators to plot the course, but that X was playing with machines that would allow a machine to plot a course to allow the folding of space. And I think they 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 figure it out, right? They That's do. At the, the point, at the yeah, end of the book, they say. At, at the end of the book, they make the indication that Ix has finally been able to, to to do that, to make that work, and that um, uh, I think that I think that uh, the honored the or that uh, in the conversation about uh, that the that the reverend mothers have just before they're going to be interviewed by great honored Matre and have the huge climactic battle, they're talking about what things haven't come from Ix, what they've been hiding, but what they've discovered. Um, and this ability then to uh, to compete with the with the guild navigators and the destruction of the monopoly on spice as a necessity for keeping the universe together. Uh, and I know that uh, I shouldn't say I know. As I was reading it, I I concluded that part of this is because with everybody's reserves of spice depleting, uh, that was part of the reason that they talked about in the axolotl tanks. They wanted Sightail to give them the information of how to create spice in the axolotl tanks because reserves of spice are depleting and they can't they don't have worms that are generating enough spice yet to make it work um opec is being i mean cho am i mean never mind <laughs> doggone it all 
stop drawing references to today. Uh, yeah, you know they can't do any more fracking. They've got to they've got to figure out some other way of dealing with it. So, right. uh, I but I think that that uh, I think that that would play another uh, potentially play another big role in Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune. Uh, is this question of of what happens when the monopoly on spice that is necessary in order to keep everybody connected is broken and somebody else finds a different way to do it. Maybe that's, you know, what solar energy is supposed to do for us. Um, His reference knows? to cyborgs. <laughs> that, oh yeah, there's cyborgs. He, he, throws, right. he throws out the reference to cyborgs and I thought that is a very 1986 word. Yeah. <laughs> and that you was, know, it was... That was somebody who was writing, who uh, was an old man who was writing in the 80s and said, this is um, something that kids would like. Yeah. It, it interesting like... that earlier he talked about artificial eyes. He didn't talk about them. You remember? You remember in one of the uh, earlier? I think it was in uh, it's Dune, Messiah, Dune Messiah, where it's very controversial to have these these uh, me- these artificial eyes, mechanical yeah. eyes that Paul, came Paul from refuses Ix. to have to have Paul, them. Yeah, himself. Paul doesn't take. Them. But Correct. he does. He does pay for all of his men to have them. I think right. Any of them that wanted them, if they yeah. they had the option to have uh, the mechanical eyes, but uh, grown. Uh, grown in axolotl tanks, replacement limbs, and so forth. But eyes were too difficult, so mechanical eyes. They were cheaper, they were easier, they were more frequent. Well, it was uh, in that fact, changed, it, it's something that changed along the Gola technology, too, because yes. the first couple of Duncan Golas had those marble eyes that were really creepy, and then it just kind of goes away. They either get used to them or they get become normalized at one yeah they talked about they talked about those reflective metal eyes right. um private but eyes then, they're watching you but then, <laughs> <laughs> but then all of a sudden yeah in the night in in this last book he starts talking about being a cyborg which uh again jack uh in in acknowledgement of what is uh in the prequels uh a lot of questions about mechanical uh mechanical augmentation of the human being um, so I, I, I'm willing to bet that you're, uh, that, 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 that I, I, I'd, I'd be all in on, yeah, it's the thinking machines coming back. Um, and that's what everybody's afraid of. Um, so we've, we've kind of, we've kind of sliced and diced this a little bit. Are there any last thoughts that you guys want to bring up about the book or, uh, did you want to use just a couple of minutes to say, oh, I'm being told, no, we can't use those couple of minutes to say anything. Our, our, time reserves, our time reserves are, 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 <laughs> are depleted. Low. Our depleted uh, our fi- spice, you know. Final thoughts. Oh, gosh. What is there to say <laughs> about Chapter House Dune? Oh, I can't think. I, I can't. How about it's finally over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I channeling have... Ken here. I, I have to admit, a couple of weeks ago, Craig and I were working out, and I did. I told him I was struggling to get through this one, but I powered through. That's what you do. I, I think that I, I think that in a lot of ways, I'm very satisfied that I can say that I have read the entire Frank Herbert Dune series. Yeah, um, a lot of posers out there pretending to be yeah. Dune fans after having only read the first book. There are going to be more of yeah. them, by the way, now that this movie is out. Yeah, they're gonna th- yeah. they're gonna say that they all know all about Dune, and I'm going to smile politely and say, "You don't know." Pat, Dune. pat them on the head. Oh, that's cute. You're cute. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully, everybody else has had a good time with this. Recommend that you finish it if you're a, somebody that wants to be a purist, and recommend that you don't finish it if you're not prepared for kind of a scattered book. Uh, and but you know, there's. Go back and read it. <laughs> there's there's enough things in it in there it, it's a potpourri there's something for everybody but the whole book, book, oh ho, ho, ho. well done well done and that's why he gets paid for those kinds of mo- uh, remarks ladies and gentlemen thanks very much for your time we'll see you next time Hey, somebody in my row at the at my showing of Dune about thirty minutes in, this person's phone started ringing. I was about to kill that person. It fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, this individual was quick on the uptake with turn with silencing it. But like one more ring, and I I was I was prepared. Like by the person I was sitting next to, my friend, 
heard an audible uh, like guttural noise in my throat. <laughs> so I was I was becoming animalistic urges were were beginning to formulate within me. You, your gom jabar was out, and that person was about to die. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> but did that did not happen. <laughs>